In the year 1940, Taniguchi Yoshiro looked on through the windows of the Yamanote line as one of Tokyo's great architectural symbols crumbled to dust. It was true, the Rokumeikan, once the center of all things cosmopolitan and high-collar in Japan, had long since been relegated to a tertiary position in the high-class milieu of the Empire. And yet, for Taniguchi, it was a somber moment, watching from afar as the walls of the building were knocked down. So much history had happened behind those walls. But more than that, the building itself had served as a national symbol for one of the most momentous eras in modern Japanese history, for good or for ill. And now, the Rokumeikan was no more. Taniguchi had a special reason to be cognizant of what was being lost. He was an architect and an accomplished one. At age 36, he had now already been a professor at the prestigious Tokyo Institute of Technology for over a decade. Taniguchi was at the forefront of the continued rush towards new modern forms of architecture, but also held a great appreciation for his own country's past. He often incorporated traditional Japanese architectural forms into his modern Western-style works. And the Rokumeikan, while wholly Western in design, represented the moment when the upper echelons of Japanese society had jumped wholeheartedly into European modernism. More than anything, it represented the Meiji era itself. The Meiji era, from 1868 to 1912, began with the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate, signaling the death knell of Japanese feudalism and the rule of the samurai. Japan opened itself to the world outside of its nearest neighbors and colonial holdings of Hokkaido and the Ryukyus, with newly empowered Emperor Meiji and his clique of statesmen and bureaucrats chasing after European technology, as well as the trappings of cultural modernity, clothing, music, political structures, even new pastimes, and, of course, architecture. Taniguchi was born in late Meiji and watched the continual breakages with the past arising from both governmental policies and devastating natural disasters. As the Rokumeikan fell, Japan was on the cusp of launching into an even worse, all-encompassing disaster, World War II. This too was something that Taniguchi would witness. It was his drive to conserve the continually destroyed and paved over history of Japan that would lead him to create one of the last few places in the country to walk amongst the buildings of Japan's first modern era. After the devastation of the war, in the hills of Inuyama, far from the concrete sea of Tokyo, he established an open-air museum where the otherwise doomed relics of modernizing Japan could continue on. The name of Taniguchi's new creation was, fittingly, Mura, the Meiji Village. Hello Minasan and welcome back to Unseen Japan. As always, I'm Noah Oskow and today we're taking a literal journey through the remnants of the recent Japanese past. This is actually the first time I was able to physically travel to a place within Japan for location shooting for one of these videos, so I hope you enjoy the result. If you enjoyed the episode, let me know and give us a like and subscribe for more, and maybe consider giving some support by joining our Patreon. After the last episode, we had our very first ever Patreon poll to decide an upcoming historical video topic, and I'll be revealing what topic won during the credits, so stick around. Alright, let's get back to the ever-changing landscape of the Japanese past. Now, the Rokumeikon was far from the only significant building of its era to face destruction. Japan, in general, is not a place where physical remnants of the past are easily maintained. Despite the image of Japan as a land of ancient temples, Shinto shrines, and castles, truly old buildings are actually few and far between. Historically, almost all buildings were made from wood, said to more easily withstand the various natural disasters Japan is beset with. Wood, however, is also susceptible to both fire and decay. Great conflagrations would regularly sweep across Japan's urban landscape, leaving little in their wake. Edo, the capital of the Tokugawa shoguns and the forerunner to Tokyo, was leveled by one disaster or another roughly every 25 years from 1600 to the firebombing of Tokyo in World War II. Japan has long held a philosophical stance of impermanence. Things are fleeting. This is something that's at the heart of the very Japanese concept of wabi-sabi. 
with things bound to eventually fade away or be utterly destroyed in an earthquake or fire or landslide or tsunami or even the rare tornado, the country didn't develop a sense of conservationism towards its own physical history until fairly recently. Castles are a good example of the belated desire to maintain the physical landscape of the past. Japan's samurai fortresses are world-renowned, however very few of the hundred or so extant castles are actually originals. Seen as relics of a feudal past during the Meiji era, when the samurai class was abolished, castles were left to rot or torn down completely. Perhaps as many as 2,000 castles were demolished. Only 12 originals remain, whereas many more ruins of the original stone moats and retaining walls can be found, since they're harder for wear, tear, and human hands to dismantle. Only too late did people realize just what had been lost and rebuilding projects started up in the 30s, 40s, and the post-war era, although often resulting in concrete structures that only maintain a traditional façade. In their interiors, one often discovers uniform white concrete walls lit by fluorescent lighting, not too different from what you'd find in a provincial museum in the former Soviet Union. The desire in the Meiji era to create a modern Japan, one that could both compete with and be considered equal to the European powers, resulted in the tearing down of many such symbols of the past. Japan's first Western-style buildings, from the short-lived Hotelukan, Japan's first hotel, to the even more impressive Imperial Hotel, arose on land previously occupied by the traditional villas of Daimyo, Samurai Lords. One of Tokyo's most famous districts, the Marunouchi, was one such lot. What is now the heart of Japan's most well-known financial district was once an inlet in Edo Bay, not far from the castle. Part of the Tokugawa shogunate's massive land reclamation projects in its new capital, the inlet was filled in in the 1590s. Soon encircled by Edo Castle's inner and outer moats, the area became known by the name now pronounced as Maru no Uchi, within the circle. The district became the home away from home for numerous daimyo, forced by the shogunate to spend off years living in Edo to prevent rebellions in the provinces. Over 24 of these lords had their great villas in the Mononouchi, but as upheaval racked Edo in the 1850s, daimyo's residences became easy targets for arson or attack by the numerous pro-imperial, anti-foreign radicals operating in Edo. Many daimyo fled to their own provincial holdings as soon as the last shogun, Yoshinobu, rescinded the centuries-old dictate necessitating residences in Edo. By the time the shogunate fell, Marunouchi was a wasteland, where weeds grew amongst the few remaining mostly abandoned lordly residences. The poet Takahashi Kyoshi described the desolate Marunouchi as the abode of foxes and badgers. The entire area was bought up in 1890 by the ascendant Mitsubishi Corporation, and became known as the Mitsubishi Gahara, the Mitsubishi Meadow. The fields were slowly returned to civilization, becoming a major part of the ostentatious Meiji push for modernization. In 1894, Mitsubishi brought in one Josiah Condor, British architect, hired foreigner, that's Oyatoi Kaikokujin, and father of Japanese architecture, to begin work on a series of three-storied, red-bricked western buildings. The neighborhood was known as the Marunouchi London Town, and together with the famed Ginza Brick Town near at hand to the south, built in the 1870s, became one of the most exciting neighborhoods in Japan for those wanting to glimpse what modernity seemed to hold in store for them. In that same year, Condor built the area's first modern office space, the Mitsubishi Ichigokan. The building was in the Queen Anne Revival style, popular in Condor's homeland. Almost simultaneously, the Meiji government was putting together plans for a central Tokyo train station to be located nearby. Upon its construction, Tokyo Station would cement Marunouchi's place as the central business district in the new, modern Tokyo. Although this had to wait until just after the Meiji Emperor's death, and the end of the era named after him. The First Sino-Japanese War interrupted the planning process. The Marunouchi of the Meiji era, whether an expanse of field or of red brick, is now largely gone. Taniguchi witnessed all these changes happening in his own time. Bombs in World War II decimated much of Tokyo Station. Mitsubishi tore down its London town after the war. Glass towers arose where once daimyo's residences stood. As Japan's economy regained its footing and then rocketed into the stratosphere in the 1980s. 
Even when physical remnants of the era remain, they're often obscured. No better example exists than the famed Nihonbashi Bridge, not far from Mononouchi. In the Edo era, it was a massive arched wooden structure spanning the waters where the five roads to Edo converged. It was one of the great entrances to the city proper, bustling with foot traffic. In the late Meiji era, the wooden bridge was torn down, replaced with a modern level stone structure. In the middle of the bridge lays the point marker, the basis of road distances for all routes in Japan. During Meiji, all around the bridge stood some of the great symbols of westernization, from the Mitsui Bank building to the Mitsukoshi department store. The area too fell victim to the horrific firebombings of World War II. The Nihonbashi Bridge survived, although some of its stones still show burn marks. One of the few remaining signs of the bombings that leveled Tokyo in 1945, killing over 100,000 people. The bridge still stands, but is mostly hidden underneath a modern overpass. Once views of Mount Fuji could be had from this bridge, but now the bridge itself can hardly be seen. Even by the time he was a student at the Tokyo University Department of Architecture in the early 1920s, Taniguchi had witnessed the cycle of destruction, development, and destruction again. The vaunted Imperial Hotel represents the process well. Built on land that had previously belonged to the Abe clan, who ruled Shirakawa in what is now Fukushima Prefecture, the first iteration of the Imperial began construction in 1888. It was the brainchild of two Meiji oligarchs, Foreign Minister Count Inoue Kaoru and Viscount Shibusawa Eiichi, soon to feature on the new 1000 yen bill. Inoue was also the statesman behind the creation of the era-defining Rokumeikan, a former samurai of Choshu Domain and a major force behind westernization projects in Japan, ironically, during the unrest leading to the Meiji Restoration, Inoue had been so opposed to anything foreign that in 1863 he'd set fire to the British legation in Edo. Now, a scant two decades later, he was the driving force behind two major buildings whose very purpose was to welcome and impress foreign dignitaries and visitors. The original Imperial Hotel opened its doors in 1890. Its name was appropriate, not only did it front the moat of the Imperial Palace, but its largest investor at 21.1% was also the Imperial Household Agency itself. The Imperial was designed by Japanese architect Watanabe Yuzuru, and was three stories high with 60 rooms. French cuisine was served in accordance with the usual fare presented at Imperial luncheons in the palace just across the moat. In 1922, the old Imperial met its fate as so many of the grand buildings of Tokyo and Edo before it, by fire. By that point, a new, chic second Imperial was already under construction. The Meiji era building was replaced by a creation of the new era, Taisho, and was a structure that would become one of Tokyo's greatest landmarks for the coming decades. Taniguchi was already witnessing the eras physically turn over all around him, with the Imperial hotels representing much of that spirit. What he couldn't know at the time, however, was that the Second Imperial, the work of internationally famed architect Frank Lloyd Wright, would become the centerpiece of the park Taniguchi would go on to be most remembered for. It was 1960, 20 years on from the demolition of the Rukumeikan, and 15 years since the devastation of World War II. Taniguchi Yoshiro has survived the conflagrations of the war, emerging into a rapidly changing Japan. Decades earlier, Taniguchi had been actively designing architecture for the Japanese Empire, including a garden for the Japanese Embassy in Germany, where he was supervised by the infamous Nazi Albert Speer. Now both Empire and Reich were gone, their terrors fading into the past. Taniguchi was involved in rebuilding the ruined urban landscapes of Japan. Face to face with such widespread destruction, he became even more concerned with the idea of historical conservation. The war, natural disasters, and development had already taken so many of the Meiji era buildings that had inspired him. In the 1950s, he joined the Cultural Property Specialist Council and the Japan Agency for Cultural Affairs, trying to bring about a greater spirit of conservatism. Such topics were on his mind as he schmoozed with former classmates at a high school reunion in his hometown of Kanazawa on the Sea of Japan. As he discussed the urgent need to preserve Meiji-era buildings for future generations before they were lost, one friend immediately took the message to heart. 
This was Tsuchikawa Moto. Tsuchikawa was, at this point, executive vice president of the Nagoya Railroad Company, called Meitetsu for short, a major train operator in central Japan. Right there, in the midst of their high school reunion, the two began brainstorming for what would eventually be called Meijimura. In 1961, Tsuchikawa had risen to president of Meitetsu. He was able to bring the considerable financial might of the company to bear on their conservation project. Soon they had established a foundation, with an architectural committee filled with historians who, when made aware of an important Meiji building in peril, would race the site like paramedics racing to save a patient. Tsuchikawa's leading role at Meitetsu also ensured that their conservatory would have the land and location needed to maintain the buildings they'd save. The company owned a scenic plot of land in the city of Inuyama, not far to the northwest of Nagoya. It lay on Lake Iruka, an uncommonly large agricultural reservoir in the mountains near the border with Gifu Prefecture. While beautiful, the reservoir has its own tragic Meiji history. In 1868, the very year of the restoration, the dam holding back the lake's waters collapsed following heavy rains. Over 900 of those in the villages downstream perished in the ensuing flood. When Meijimura opened to the public in March 18th, 1965, it was home to 15 Meiji-era structures saved from an untimely fate. Their origins were diverse. Some were from farther south in the old imperial capital of Kyoto, while even distant Hokkaido was represented. Taniguchi himself served as the Open Air Museum's first director. The collection of relocated, rebuilt, and refurbished buildings would only increase, and would soon gain its most famous addition. Frank Lloyd Wright, perhaps America's most famous architect, had long been fascinated by Japanese design. Wright was born a world away from Japan, in Wisconsin. His birth came in 1857, the year before the shogunate fell and the Meiji period began all the way across the Pacific. By the late 1880s, as newfangled western edifices were going up all over Japan, Wright was falling in love with traditional Japanese prints. That's ukiyo-e. In 1905, he took his first trip outside of the United States, heading on a months-long tour of Japan. Arriving in the late Meiji era, he was able to witness much of the old Japan he'd become fascinated with, as well as witness the industrialization and westernization that had swept across the country since Commodore Matthew Perry opened Japan to the west in the years before Wright's birth. In 1911, the last year of Emperor Meiji's rule, Wright was put in contact with the manager of the Imperial Hotel, Hayashi Aisaku. Hayashi was looking for an architect to design a new Imperial. Wright jumped at the opportunity. As soon as he was in Japan, he started a design process that would culminate in the opening of the second Imperial Hotel in 1923. The building was markedly larger than the first Imperial, with over 240 rooms and long 500-foot wings. The building mixed Mayan revival stylings carved out of igneous oya stone, with subtle Japanese aspects. In front of the lobby was a large reflecting pool. In 1922, as Wright was working on the then-in-process structure, a large earthquake hit Tokyo. It was only days after fire had ravaged the first Imperial Hotel, and the earthquake toppled what remained of it. The second Imperial, however, was undamaged. An even greater challenge to its foundations came just the next year, when the Great Kanto Earthquake racked Tokyo and beyond. Over 70% of the city's buildings crumbled, and fires took the lives of over 100,000 people. Yet Wright's marvel still stood. As one of the few buildings of its size left standing, it served as an important staging ground for disaster response in the days that followed. The building's survival became the stuff of legend, and Wright made sure all the tabloids back in the United States knew of his success. The hotel was one of the great landmarks of the Tokyo of its day. Charlie Chaplin stayed at the hotel in 1932, and is said to have deeply enjoyed the restaurant's wagyu, Japanese beef. This was on the same trip where Chaplin narrowly missed assassination by far-right militarists during the League of Blood incident, an event that Japanese Red Army leader Shigenobu Fusako's father was involved in. The second Imperial Hotel was the very height of resplendent extravagance for 1920s and 30s Japan. However, despite claims that the hotel was earthquake-proof, its foundations had in fact been seriously compromised in the 1923 quake. Floors bulged. The building sank into the mud Wright had built it on top of under the assumption that said mud would produce a dampening effect during quakes. 
Even before World War II, management understood a third Imperial would have to be built. Then, the building received further damage during the firebombings of the war. When the US occupation forces arrived to a devastated Tokyo, the Imperial was co-opted by the occupying military. After being returned to Japanese ownership in 1952, it continued to attract stars from abroad. In fact, Marilyn Monroe stayed there not long after. The Grand Hotel's days were, however, numbered. In 1967, and despite some degree of public outcry, it was announced that the Second Imperial would be demolished. In its place would rise a sleek, modern high-rise, capable of taking on the number of guests necessary in a Tokyo now in a state of continual economic growth. In order to save the building, Taniguchi leapt into action, despite it being from an era that had already begun to replace the edifices of Meiji. The base structure, being of concrete, could not be salvaged, but as much of the trappings and Oya stone as possible were rescued prior to demolition. By March 1968, Wright's Imperial was no more. In 1970, reconstruction of the lobby at its new site in Inuyama began. The exterior took six years. Seven years later, Meiji Mura began reconstructing the interior, which was finished in 1985. By this time, both Taniguchi and Tsuchikawa had passed. Their hard work, however, had ensured that Wright's most famous Japanese building would live on, at least in some form. It has since gone on to be by far the most famous building at Meiji Mura, where visitors love to walk its halls, sipping coffee in its recreated cafe on the mezzanine complete with Wright-designed furniture. In its interior, at least some sense of its era remains. So directly behind me you see the old Second Imperial Hotel in all of its uh, truncated glory. Uh, of course, it used to be a much larger building. It used to have an entire wing in the back and two wings on the side, but this is the lobby and the entrance, and this is really the, uh, the most famous building here at Meiji Mura. For a relaxing time. For a relaxing time. Always make it Imperial Hotel. These days, Meiji Mura is home to over 60 reconstructed buildings representing the recent Japanese past. The buildings are spread out over a wide, hilly area with many perched on panoramic hilltops. These include the rambling halls of the Mie Prefectural Office, built in 1879 a great representation of the wooden western-style government offices built throughout Japan in the early Meiji era. Emperor Meiji himself visited the offices in 1880, and they were in operation all the way until 1964. And, of course, Emperor Meiji himself. Meiji and Emperor Shokin's opulent private train cars are in a garage nearby. Hospitals, schoolhouses, private homes, and more abound. One such belonged to Saigo Sugumichi, younger brother to Meiji Restoration legend Saigo Takamori, he of The Last Samurai fame. Another is the villa of Prince Saionji Kinmochi, one of the most significant political figures of the 1920s and 1930s. Yet another is the summering house of author Lafcardio Hearn, author of Kwaidan and numerous other books on Japanese ghost stories and urban legends. Built in 1868, the building was originally in Shizuoka Prefecture and now hosts a small confectionery store, and a standee demonstrating just how short Hearn was. The sheer variety of buildings makes mentioning them all a difficult prospect within a narrative of the size of this video. Both western style and more traditional architecture from Meiji through early Showa abound. There's the Sapporo Telephone Exchange, built in 1898. The building was constructed in stone to protect the expensive technological contraptions therein from fire, a worry even in the colder northern reaches of Hokkaido, even then still in the process of being settled by Japan. There's the Kurehaza Kabuki Theater from the very first year of Meiji, where performances are still held. There's a prison, its wooden bars still resembling those of the feudal era. A police box that used to stand in front of Nishi Honganji Temple in Kyoto remains at the ready. A red-roofed photographer's studio welcomes you to view old family portraits taken during its years of operation. A high latch near the ceiling once allowed the owner to ascend to the roof to remove a 
accumulated snow, the building originally having been located in snow-swept Niigata Prefecture. A large, beautiful sake brewery from Aichi showcases the tools of the trade. And Meiji Muro's collection goes beyond the borders of Japan itself. The Meiji era was the first period in which Japanese nationals were allowed to emigrate beyond the archipelago. Amongst the upheaval of modernization also came great poverty with some left behind by societal changes. With both the encouragement of the Meiji government itself and the receiving countries in need of low-wage workforces, impoverished Japanese began their long journeys to the three regions they would become home to more ethnic Japanese than anywhere on earth outside of the homeland. These were Brazil, the west coast of the United States, and Hawaii. All three diaspora communities are actually represented at Meiji Mura. The oldest is the Hawaii Immigrants Assembly House, built in the town of Hilo on the Big Island in 1889. At the time, the land was actually still in the Kingdom of Hawaii, still four years off from the overthrow of the indigenous monarchy and the annexation by the United States that followed. The building was initially designed as a church catering to Japanese Christians, watched over by its head pastor, Okabe Jiro, who would eventually become an important statesman back in Japan. After its functions as a church ceased, it became an important community space for the Japanese immigrant population of Hilo. These days, it houses various displays demonstrating the lifestyles and occupations Japanese immigrants in Hawaii undertook. Next to the building, the flag of Hawaii flutters in the breeze. Just across from the house flies another flag, the green and yellow of Brazil. This two-story rambler with sloped tiled brown roofs was the creation of Japanese immigrant Kubota Yasuo. Kubota moved to the coast near Sao Paulo in the early Taisho era, building his home in 1919. Life on the local coffee plantations was a difficult one, and Kubota had to endeavor doubly as hard in order to clear enough of the nearby forest to build his new home. He hired a fellow Japanese immigrant to design the house, who incorporated a number of Japanese elements. Inside, one finds numerous displays featuring the lives of Japanese immigrants to Brazil, who, as followers of our channel will know, now make up the largest diaspora community of Japanese in the world. There is even a model of the Kasato Maru, which ferried the first group of Japanese immigrants to Brazil in 1908. Lastly comes a home that would not look out of place in many an American city. Appropriately, a United States flag flies nearby. This was, at one point, the Seattle Nikkei Evangelical Church. Built in 1908 as a standard residence in Seattle, it was bought by a group of Japanese immigrants in the 1930s. For these Japanese immigrants, owning such a house was the product of hard work in difficult circumstances over a long period of time. Yet, the house was cruelly appropriated from the Japanese owners during World War II and the resident family was rounded up and sent to internment. Following the war, a separate group of Japanese evangelicals bought the property, turning it into a church. The main living room is still arranged as if for a religious service. As the population of Japanese Christians in the area dwindled, the building's use came to an end, and it was moved to Meijimura. These three buildings demonstrate a fact often glossed over in Japan that Japanese culture and populations reach beyond the main islands into a historical diaspora with a history just as vital. Meiji was the era when that diaspora began. Seeing artifacts of those communities at home amongst the buildings of Japan's ages of modernization brings home just how much the diaspora's history is part of the nation's story as a whole. So this was uh, the foreign settlement in the 1880s in Nagasaki. This is where foreigners coming to Nagasaki to trade were to live, which in other words means that this is our house and we can do as we please. In March of 2021, it was announced that all 17 stories and 772 guest rooms of Tokyo's current Imperial Hotel will soon be demolished. This third iteration of the Imperial has had its share of storied happenings since opening in 1970, including hosting the 2005 marriage of Princess Sayako, sole daughter of Emperor Akihito and Empress Michiko. Amongst the numerous eateries and drinking establishments within the current hotel is to be found the Old Imperial Bar. The hotel's official website describes the venue as a patrician salute to our architectural heritage of Frank Lloyd Wright with fascinating motifs from the 1923 Imperial, and masterfully concocted spirits from around the world. 
presumably this bar will soon be just as much a thing of the Tokyo past as is Wright's great architectural monument itself. The land beneath the current imperial was once the sloshing waters of Edo Bay. Then it became reclaimed land, home to numerous refined samurai estates. There, wooden eaves fell into disuse and uprose new western-style buildings, testaments to the industrialization and modernization of Japan. The first imperial, one such edifice, burned and uprose the second imperial, even more modern and chic. Then, Wright's creation was dismantled and the gleaming towers of the third imperial rose in its place. And now, even that building is slated for destruction, making way for a massive urban renewal project at a price point of $1.8 billion. Truly, the rule of Tokyo, and the physical landscape of Japan as a whole, is change. Even when disasters have been somewhat tamed, impermanence remains the assumption. That's why a place like Meijimura is so important. A building the size of the current imperial can't just be moved and rebuilt. In fact, that wasn't even quite possible for Wright's much smaller imperial, which only consists of its lobby in reconstructed form. But in some sense, while divorced from its urban setting, from the high society crowds of Japan's Roaring Twenties, it does live on. So do the other older buildings of Meijimura. One of Kyoto's first streetcars runs the length of the park, with tourists dressed in the maroon hakama of the Meiji era's high-collar schoolgirls riding along. These artifacts of ages gone by live out a new life in a land and time apart. And somewhere out there, we can only imagine, Taniguchi Yoshiro must be smiling. Alright everyone, thanks for watching this one. I actually originally conceived this as a fairly simple travel video explaining a bit about Meijimura and the issue of conservationism in Japan. But being me, it morphed into a full video essay, which is what you see before you right now. In fact, it became more than that because I ended up writing an entire other essay of the same length focusing in on specifically why so little of the architecture of the Meiji era remains in Tokyo, which you can read over at unseenjapan.com. It's worth mentioning that there are a few other similar open-air historical architectural museums in Japan that are absolutely worth checking out, like the aptly named Tokyo Edo Open Air Museum near my old college dorms in Kogane, Tokyo, as well as the fascinating Kaitakumura, the historical village of Hokkaido, which is very similar to Meijimura in time frame and setup, but specifically hosts buildings from the era when Japan was settling Hokkaido and Moss following the Meiji Restoration. So I was very happy to see the amount of engagement we got with the poll over on Patreon for our next video. Our members have spoken, and the next video topic will be, drumroll please, When Tokyo Was Socialist, The Story of Governor Minobe. The topic eked out a close victory against the Lockheed Scandal and the disappearance of Japan's second largest lake, which each tied for second. Thanks to those who participated. I'll be getting to work on this one right away, so consider joining up if you'd like to vote on the next poll. As always, thanks for the support. Alright, I'm getting back to my research, so until next time, matane. Meiji and Empress Shoken's private train cards... Oh. <laughs>